Uh, thanks. I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and, and uh, 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 thank Alana and, and Karen for covering so much ground before I, uh, before I start so that uh, I can focus on uh, a, a couple of narrower issues. Um, I want to start with, with, with just a picture, uh, which is not going to be a surprise to anybody here, but uh, which shows um, uh, non-agricultural non employment, uh, labor force uh, uh, of the of the active labor force in uh, in at the country level, where the vertical axis is the share who are own account workers, and the horizontal axis is the share who are employers, and the square boxes are uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and the diamonds are are Europe. Uh, so you know basically the point is half of the labor force in sub-Saharan Africa is an own account worker. Um, uh, very large numbers of, 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 uh, of, of, of self-employed, uh, at least in the cross-section, and you know, we can ask whether this is true in, uh, longitudinally as well, but at least in the cross-section, uh, development is a process of moving from the upper left towards the lower right. That is, firm sizes grow, uh, the lar large uh, uh, firms become larger uh, as, we, uh, as, as, incomes, as incomes rise, at least in the, the cross-section. So what do we know about moving downward and to the right on the graph? Um, I would argue not very much, at least yet anyway. Um, and what I want to talk about uh, today is uh, some of the progress, the small progress that we've made, and why progress is so difficult using the, the techniques and methods that, we've, we're, we, we, uh, that have been popular in the last, uh, the last 10 years, particularly field experiments. And uh, what's out there and what's going on now in what I see is a very new and exciting area. And, and let me step back and say, I think if I look back 30 years uh, and ask about uh, development research, uh, my view is that, uh, uh, is that firms have been tremendously understudied and have been sort of marginalized in the, in, in the research agenda. Uh, this reflects, I think, uh, Santiago's uh, point this morning that productivity is, matters even for things if we think about uh, inequality and so forth. We have to think about what's going on with firms, what's going on with the private sector. And um, so, you know, so we can ask a series of questions. Where do large employers come from? Are large firms born? Can they be built? Are exports necessary for large, to produce large firms, to, to generate large firms and so forth? I want to focus on one, and, and, and this, is, this is far from an exhaustive list. I want to focus on one, do, do the micro ever become medium or, or even small? What, what, do we, what do we know about that? Well, you know, we can think about a, just a standard AKL production function. Uh, worker, uh, firms take capital and labor, they combine it with technology, ability, other kinds of uh, other, other uh, ways that they become more productive. Uh, and we ask, what are the constraints to growth? Well, it's likely all three of these. It's likely labor, capital, and, uh, and skills or, or, or technology. I'm going to focus first on capital constraints, given that I have limited time. Um, and, um, and also for a point that I'll make later, I'll, I'll say something about, about the A part, uh, the, 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 techno the uh, technology or, or ability uh, uh, a part of the, uh, of, of the production function. So this is a place, Alan said that, uh, you know, the micro has disconnected from the macro. I think in firms research, this is a place where the macro has sort of driven in the last three or four or five years, especially, uh, a renewed interest in, in firms and especially in, in large firms. So at the macro level, there's a evidence of serious uh, misallocation of resources across firms and across sectors and across individuals. Um, you know, Banerjee and Flow's handbook chapter uh, pointed this out. Uh, uh, Cheng Tashe and Pete Klee now pick up on it, uh, looking at firms in India and India, China, and, and comparing them with, uh, with the US uh, in a 2008 uh, QJE paper. Uh, that paper's probably done more to generate research and development on firms than anything uh, that's, that's been done in the, last, uh, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, you know, We've known for a long time, or we've thought for a long time, that there are constraints on, on access to credit, constraints on capital, particularly among the poor. Uh, but until recently, I'd argue that convincing evidence on this has been, has, been, has been lacking. So what does the more recent evidence say? So, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say I think there's something of a puzzle. Um, 
from several field experiments, and I've listed uh, self-servingly three that I've that I've been involved in here in uh, in Sri Lanka, Ghana, and Mexico, but there but there are others as well. Uh, we have evidence of quite high re marginal returns uh, to capital in small enterprises. So these are all projects which were field experiments in which capital was uh, given to uh, microenterprise owners, existing microenterprise owners, uh, and uh, and we look at what happens um, uh, with uh, to uh, to profitability, sales, other other measures of of, uh, of outcomes for these uh, for these firms. Uh, the Sri Lanka work was the the first. Uh, this is all work that I've done with David McKenzie and 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 others. The Sri Lanka work with with Suresh with uh, Suresh Demel as well. Um, the Sri Lanka work was the earliest, and we've now we've done a six year follow up. We find continued high returns among the people that got uh, a, a small grant. You know, six years earlier, we've just. Uh, uh, are we just about to go to the field with a with a ten year uh, follow up on these on these same uh, on these same firms, um, but we find uh, returns of around six percent per month, much higher than uh, uh, microfinance uh, costs or, or microfinance uh, interest rates. Uh, similarly in Ghana, uh, similarly in Mexico, we find uh, marginal returns which are far in excess of, uh, of, of 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 standard interest rates, and yet. You know that we now also have several uh, field experiments uh, on microfinance itself. Uh, there was a, a special issue of the AJ Applied in January 2015 that reported on on six of these: uh, India, Mexico, Bosnia, Ethiopia, uh, Mongolia. Maybe there are only five. I think there were. Uh, uh, maybe I've, either I've missed one or there are only five. Uh, but in any case, reported on several of these, and I, I think the takeaway from that is that. The, the, the effect of microfinance on businesses and on firms is, rel is, is fairly modest. It's underwhelming. Um, and so there's a puzzle. If firms have really high returns to capital, why is microfinance not having a, a, a larger effect? Why, is, why, why don't we see a larger effect? So puzzle is a good result. Um, and I think you know, it's an example of how uh, the research gets pushed forward when we when we uh, when we have evidence that people find uh, uh, find credible and that and that they're able to 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 to, to move back and forth on. This, the puzzle stimulates thinking about why the differences are there, and I think there are a couple of interesting experiments. One that's underway now that I, that um, but one that's uh, uh, by Erica Field and and others uh, that was uh, published in the AER last uh, last year. Uh, where they said, look, maybe what's going on here is that the need to start repaying immediately on these microfinance loans uh, is a constraint to risk taking. I can't make an investment that has any kind of uh, long-term uh, return because long-term, even two months or three months return because uh, I have to start paying right away. So they offered uh, 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 a subset of the borrowers a two-month grace period. They show up for the loan unannounced. They're, they're, they're offered uh, a, a two-month grace period. They don't have to start making payments for uh, a period of two months. And what do they find? Well, the good news is it works. Borrowers uh, who have the grace period invest very differently. They invest more in the business. They take riskier investments. Uh, and those riskier investments have much higher returns. They, 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 they estimate the returns of around 9% a month. From the investments that are made by the by the um, of the people who are given a grace period, but the bad news is that default rates also go up from about two percent to about nine percent, and when they sort of put the number to it and uh, put the look at the numbers and and uh, develop a sort of very simple structural model to ask, does it make sense for microfinance institutions to offer this? Uh, kind of a, a contract, they say no. So obviously, if they offered it, they'd have to raise interest rates. If they raise interest rates, there are adverse selection, moral hazard problems, and so forth. And they sort of take take that through through a model, and they say by the time they get to where the interest, the equilibrium interest rate would have to be, given the selection process as we go, uh, no one would be left to to to, to take loans at that uh, at that interest rate. So, uh, but I think this this does at least say. Maybe there's something, and this is this is far from the final word. But I think it it it's a it's a way of of, of saying that I, this is an area where I see there's been some progress with the methodologies that have been quite quite common in the 
uh, in, the, uh, in, in recent years uh, with the experimental techniques. It's an area where the experimental techniques have taken us forward. But capital is the easy one. Because if I believe that the only constraint to the enterprise is capital, there's only one form of capital that matters. I just give them cash. Or I go and ask them what do they want to buy, and I buy it for them. So if I believe that's the only constraint, then there's just one thing to, to, to design the, the, the intervention around. We still talk about external validity. We can do this in different places with different samples. Uh, it's still gonna, that's still going to matter. But it's a, it's a, it's a potentially solvable problem. Uh, it, you know, the dimensionality is not, is not too big because there's only one uh, uh, relevant intervention. If I think about the A in um, AKL production functions, with respect to micro, micro enterprises, typically we think of this as training for the, for the entrepreneur. Uh, uh, David and I have a review of 16 experiments. At, this is from a few years ago. So at the time, 16 randomized experiments on microenterprise training. Um, and the punchline that we take from that is we really haven't learned anything at all from these experiments. Um, and what's the problem? The problem is that there is no single A. It's not like K. You can't give the same training to every population. University, some of, the, some of these 16 experiments are on, on university graduates. Some are on people who are illiterate. Some are women. Some are uh, in specific sectors. Uh, the, the, obviously, some are rural, some are urban. There are so many different contexts. What's relevant as training is, varies in so many different dimensions that I guess I wonder if we're ever going to make uh, really substantial progress on figuring out what works for training uh, through, uh, th through sort of standardized, randomized experiments. I think this is a place where we reach the limits. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some good experiments that we can't learn something and that we can't learn something about specific policies and specific contexts. But are we going to learn something general? It's going to be a whole lot harder because, uh, because there's so much, the, the dimensionality is so much greater when it comes to, to, to these, uh, to these um, and microenterprises are the easy one as well. Um, it's not clear that moving from the upper left to the lower right is about getting small businesses to grow. There's, there is some evidence. John Sutton's done some very interesting work on you know, sort of backing, out, backing the history, looking at the histories of large enterprises in several African countries that suggest that most of them started not as microenterprises in manufacturing, say, but as traders or some other in some other sector, uh, and and then when they started the actual firm that's that's large, it was large from the from from the beginning. Um, there's a you know there are a lot fewer large firms, so it's a lot harder to do a large randomized experiment with large firms. They're more challenging to work with. Uh, Suresh. Demel in, in Sri Lanka would uh, occasionally get a call from one of our uh, microenterprise uh, panel people and who said, who would say, nobody came to visit me last month. Aren't you going to come? Um, I'm doing some work now with large firms in Bangladesh, and let me tell you, none of them ever call us and say anything like that. In fact, usually what they call and say is, you were supposed to come today, don't. Uh, it's much more difficult. It's much more challenging to work with, 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 uh, with, with large firms in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this kind of way. But I think there are other opportunities out there, and there's a lot of work that I think is very exciting that's going on now. There's, there's now, they're now. Uh, I run a very large grant, uh, 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 organize a very large grants program for for DFID on private private enterprise development in low income countries. Uh, you know, we funded a lot of projects. The International Growth Centers funded a lot of projects. There's there's now an increasing amount of, of funding going into this this area, uh, and I think there are opportunities in, in a couple areas. There are opportunities in administrative data. Uh, Alan mentioned this as well. Uh, a lot of firms have uh, very good administrative records. IT costs have fallen a lot faster than analysis costs. There's an opportunity, in a sense, for us to say, you have all these data, you have some people who are able to analyze them, but those people are even busier than we are. Uh, if you share the data with us, we'll give you some reports back and we'll help you understand what the data, what the data are saying. And, and we found that that's that that we we uh, that, that that some firms at least are are willing to to open their uh, administrative data um, uh, under those those kinds of terms. Government data also exists in a lot of countries. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, access is 
still tends to be pretty personalized. Uh, although the program I run is, is funded by DFID and they want us to fund only things in the 35, now it's 31 low income countries, uh, we, fund uh, we fund things in Brazil because Brazil has very good matched employer employee data. Uh, something that exists in other in some of the low income countries, but is un, is is currently uh, unavailable. Uh, so so I think there's an opportunity there if we can figure out how how to uh, get uh, secure access to those data. But I want to say I think we're beginning to see progress on on large firms from a variety of methods. Some of it is experimental. Uh, uh, I'm doing some work in 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 in, in Bangladesh and, and other places in garments that's that's experimental. But a lot of it is is uh, uh, is not. I, I've mentioned John Sutton's enterprise maps. Uh, Nick Bloom and, and co-authors uh, have done a lot of work. Nick and, and John Van Reenen have done work mapping management practices across uh, countries. Uh, there's uh, Nick ha and some others have an experiment on management practices in, in India. And then I think we're beginning to see a re return. When I was in graduate school, industry studies was sort of a pejorative word. It was something that you, know, you didn't want to be doing. Uh, I think we're beginning to see a return to, to industry studies. And again, this goes back to something Alon said, where, where I think it's um, people diving into an industry, really trying to understand uh, the, the institutional structure of the industry, the microanalytics of, of the industry. Uh, and you know, several examples, uh, David Atkin and, and several others uh, have projects on um, soccer balls in Pakistan and, and rug exporting in, uh, uh, in India. Uh, Dan Keniston is doing some work on uh, the brick sector uh, in, uh, uh, in India. Uh, Raka Machiavello and Amit Morari uh, doing work on coffee uh, and so forth. And I'm working with several others on, uh, on, on garments and places. And I think we'll begin to see some interesting work coming out of these projects. They're, they're not quick projects. They take, uh, you know, Dan's been, Dan Keniston's been doing survey work for, for, for three or four years. Uh, I don't think he has a paper yet because the survey work is all set up to kind of thinking about how do I design experiments? How do I think about uh, getting, getting variation? How do I think about using uh, the data? So I think in common with other uh, topics in, in economics generally, we've had an evolution, or at least with, with development, but we've had an evolution in research methodology from, from theory-intensive work uh, and big, big kind of thinking uh, to more observational data-driven work and experimental work. And I think now we're sort of pushing back towards, towards theory. I think the, 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 the best work that I see is, is work that's combining uh, uh, experimental work and, 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 uh, uh, and theory. And, uh, and uh, so let me just sort of uh, give a couple of thoughts and in, in uh, concluding thoughts on the bigger picture. So I, when I was in graduate school, uh, I remember somebody one time mentioning Ronald McKinnon, and it was, uh, was that person was sort of ridiculed for, for you know, for because the idea that capital markets could be could could uh, explain under development was just seen as something that was just crazy. There were there are too many other things going on that that couldn't be part of the uh, that couldn't be part of it. I think we've moved a long way. We've moved a long way from that. But for the first half of the last thirty years, uh, at least the formal domestic private sector uh, has hardly been on the development agenda. There's been a lot of work on, on inf informality since, since from, from, from the 70s. There's been a lot of work on informal firms. There's been work on trade policy and, and, and trade. But, but if we think about the, 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 the domestic formal uh, private sector, uh, there's, been much, there's been much less. So I expect uh, when we have the 50th uh, uh, anniversary of, uh, of UNU wider that, uh, that we'll see uh, the private sector playing a much bigger role. I think the work that's going on there now uh, finally is uh, is catching up with the rest of uh, with with the rest of uh, of, of development, uh, and uh, and uh, and it's and it's using a mixture of the methods we've been that have been prominent in the last ten years, experiments and so forth, and new administrative data from various from various sources. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you.